all around the globe the activities of the human race conflict with the natural world even the sea once thought eternal is now threatened where industrial humanity touches its edge to measure and control that threat may be the most urgent task facing mankind today To warm-blooded, air-breathing mammals like humans, the sea is an alien environment. To explore it requires special equipment and a degree of courage few possess. But the rewards are spectacular. To Clay Bryce of the Western Australian Museum, you might say night diving is all in a day's work. The ocean is a really big place, especially at night, where the torch beam has such a small effect. But the habitats revealed are very rich and abound with marine life. Amazing, really, considering the busy industry above. My colleagues and I have the daunting task of recording this animal life, both the known and the unknown. Clay and an international team of marine biologists have come to Dampier with its vast industrial port complex to monitor the delicate marine life of the area. Dawn finds Clay finishing his night's exploration while his colleagues are still preparing for their day's work. The Dampier Archipelago is a group of islands where industry comes into direct contact with one of Australia's richest and most varied marine habitats. Finding out what animals live here and how their lives interact is the first step in understanding the pressures humanity is putting on the environment. It's a daunting task for the team assembled from around the world. The Dampier Archipelago lies off the northwest coast of Western Australia. Its 42 islands are low and flat, covered in sparse vegetation and interspersed with giant ships. You'd expect a lot of pollution in a busy port like Dampier. It functions 24 hours a day, processing and loading iron ore, liquefied gas and salt. But Dampier is a strange place. There's no visible pollution anywhere. No oil slicks, plastic bags or industrial rubbish. It's clean. For nearly 40 years, industry has been a main feature of the landscape. Wherever you look, there are huge processing plants, wharves, pipelines and associated businesses. They all make their mark on the shoreline. So what does this mean for the marine environment and the animals after four decades of intense industrialisation? Are they in as good a shape as the shoreline appears to be? The shoreline is relatively new in geological terms. It was formed about 7,000 years ago when a minor episode of global warming caused the sea level to rise, flooding the coastal valleys. Only hills and ridges remained above the surface. Today they form a natural harbour close to a wealth of natural resources. There are no freshwater springs, but the rainfall is enough to support isolated populations of mammals, including wallabies and kangaroos. The encroaching sea worked away at the new islands, creating a wide variety of habitats. Rocky shores in some places, sandy beaches in others, and even mangrove forests in sheltered bays and inlets. Between the islands, the seabed has taken on a wide range of forms, from coral reefs and soft, silty plains to sponge gardens in deeper water. It's a paradise for all kinds of sea life. The underlying rocks are 2.8 billion years old, but in terms of the Earth's history, the habitats are very young. 
The surrounding waters are under pressure from that other newcomer on the scene, mankind. Hey guys, diet depth site's 11 metres. Uh, it's rough topography, it's got encrusting corals, gorgonium. Many of the researchers have never dived uh, these waters before. The team is briefed carefully before each dive, taking note of the conditions and preparing for any eventuality. Yeah, if I'm tending to go too much into the shallows where you don't, you know, and you want to stay low, we can just say, OK. They're all experienced divers, but any new location is potentially dangerous. They must be ready for the unexpected. Sharks and giant manta rays are conspicuous. They can hardly be overlooked, but they are just the topmost branches of a tree of life whose roots stretch deep into the ocean bed. The team has come to look for smaller, less obvious members of the undersea community. They can't expect to search the whole ocean floor. It's huge and their time is limited. The answer is in a special kind of survey a strip transect. The tape marks the course to be taken by the video camera. Later, the video will be analysed and the animals counted to provide a random survey of the corals, soft corals and sponges in the area. Animals hidden under the sand or moving through the area have to be counted by hand in the old way. hermit crab is among them. On the video, it'll look like a dead shell, but it's very much alive, safe in its borrowed armour as it picks over the debris in search of food. Another hermit crab is living inside the abandoned tube of a feather duster worm, filtering its food from the passing current with specially adapted antennae. Spidery shrimps patrol the ocean floor, picking up unconsidered trifles. There's a vast range of food here and an equally huge number of habitats, so that the reef can support a truly enormous number of different animals. This is biodiversity on a grand scale. Many biologists say that coral reefs have a greater biodiversity than rainforests. The abundance of feathery filter feeders shows how much food is carried by the currents sweeping over the reef. The current is a mode of transport for some bottom dwellers, like the aptly named Spanish Dancer, a sea slug that can dance to escape predators. There's a wide range of shellless mollusks, all related to the Spanish dancer. One stands tall like a miniature dragon, while a more lowly pair mate on the floor of the reef. They are hermaphrodite, having both male and female sex organs. In order to reproduce, they need to exchange sperm. They can't fertilize themselves. On almost every dive, the researchers find new creatures, some of them as yet unnamed. One of the joys of the biological collector is to find an animal that's not in the identification books. The more experience a collector has, the better he knows what he doesn't know. Dr. Mats Berggren has found a shrimp in an anemone, one he's never seen before. Is it new to science or just new to him? He'll have to take it back to the boat to check the library of scientific texts, reference books and photographs on board. 
he's rather hoping that it doesn't have a name later he might be able to discover why the shrimp is associated with the anemone whether for food shelter or a combination of both the association between this cleaner shrimp with its long slender antennae and the fish it services is much clearer the fish comes to the shrimp when they need cleaning they hang in the water so that the shrimp can pick off parasites and dead skin both sides win the fish gets cleaned and the shrimp gets lunch and Dr. Berggren loves it. It's beautiful to look in. Just sit there and watch them. But not all the underwater world is as sweet and charming. The divers have to be on their guard against some of the local inhabitants. The golden head sea snake has a very inquisitive nature and a lethal bite, producing death in less than three hours. With a fluid, undulating motion, it swims close to divers to smell them with its forked tongue. People are afraid of sea snakes, mostly because they don't know their true nature. They're rarely aggressive, just curious. Nevertheless, they can be alarming when they suddenly appear out of some dark cranny in the reef, and the reef has plenty of crannies. The ability to hide is what keeps most reef animals alive in their crowded communities. For reef dwellers, danger comes most often from above, but these giant mantas are no threat. They're mostly plankton feeders. Even so, they're accompanied by hitchhiking remoras, which normally ride on sharks, feeding on their leftovers. These remoras are using the manta not so much as a source of food as to save energy. By riding in the manta's slipstream, the remoras also gain a degree of protection and a free ride around the reefs. They can always make a short excursion to grab a bite to eat. One of the more bizarre associations on the reef is between the giant oyster called Hyotissa and pairs of tiny shrimps, which spend their entire life inside it. It's not so much that the world is their oyster. For them, their oyster is the world. The shrimps live in folds of tissue deep inside the clam. What either side gains from the cohabitation is not clear, the expedition hopes to find out by studying as many examples as they can find. Crabs often form associations with completely unrelated animals. From his long experience of diving on reefs, Clay has become familiar with the ones that hide in coral. I hadn't given these little crabs much thought over the years. Just one of those common sights, crabs hiding in coral. When Peter Castro, a US researcher, signaled me over to look at the crown of thorns sea star, apparently feeding on coral, I went with polite indulgence. It certainly was nothing new, but what he showed me was truly amazing. Small trapezia crabs defending their coral home with ferocious intent. They were actually driving off the hungry crown of thorns. Coral colonies without these crabs have a distinct disadvantage when it comes to defence. But I still feel sorry for the sea star. This time it will have to go hungry. The most extensive underwater habitats and the most interesting to the expedition are not the beautiful coral reefs but the less photogenic areas of sand, silt and mud known collectively as the soft sediment habitat. To look at, they're barren and rather boring, yet they are home to an amazing wealth of animal life.
The feather duster worm lives in a leathery tube to protect its soft body under the sand. Its fantastic frilled ruff has two functions, breathing and collecting food. The sea cucumber also lives buried in the sand. It uses its tentacles covered with sticky pads of mucus to catch drifting food particles. It sucks each arm clean one by one inside its mouth before putting them out again with a fresh coat of mucus ready to catch more food. To be small, soft and tasty can be a problem in this hostile environment. One way of eating without being eaten is to be transparent, like this little shrimp. Another is to be able to disappear at the drop of a hat, such as this shame-faced crab. This vast repertoire of disappearing tricks makes the animals of the soft sediments hard to find. Many of them never show their faces on the surface at all. Collecting them would be something of a problem, but for the airlift. The water rising up the tube carries silt with it, which passes through a fine mesh bag where it is sieved, trapping any animals living in the sediment. The researcher whose job it is to hold the bag onto the top of the pipe has a difficult time. Buffeted by bubbles, his wetsuit filled with fine sand. None of the bottom dwellers has any defense against the airlift, though the snapping shrimp has a very elaborate alarm system, its companion Gobi. While the shrimp is busy cleaning out their shared burrow, it keeps one antenna touching the Gobi at all times. If the fish sees trouble approaching, it dives for cover so that the shrimp has an early warning of danger. After their day among the animals at the soft sediments, the team take a well-earned rest, anchored under the lights of the port. For some, work must continue into the night as they examine the creatures brought back from the day's dives. They're not the first naturalists to investigate the marine life of the Dampier archipelago. The first gave his name to the place. In 1699, William Dampier, on board his small ship, the Roebuck, sailed into the islands. He was a complex character, part cutlass-wielding pirate and part explorer, and a devoted student of natural history. He kept copious notes, which were published to an enthusiastic reception back in England. He wrote in his journal, We saw three water serpents swimming about in the sea, of a yellow colour, spotted with dark brown spots. They were each about four foot long. We had in the night abundance of whales about the ship, some ahead, others astern, and some on each side blowing and making a very dismal noise. Indeed, the noise that they made was very dreadful to us. Nighttime brings rest for the team, but for many of the animals of Dampier's archipelago, it's the start of a period of intense activity. The boat lights attract plankton and the animals that feed on it. These in turn attract larger predators. Hungry garfish gamble on catching dinner without becoming dinner themselves, but they lose. The dolphins work together to run down any fish caught within the pool of light cast by the boat. Soon the waters are alive with marine organisms of all shapes and sizes. This gives museum researcher Sue Morrison the perfect opportunity to sample the aquatic soup. She can add to the daytime list animals from the night shift, building up the expedition's catalogue of Dampier's vast array of marine life. 
but one gets away an octopus one that has not yet been given a scientific name or any name parachutes away from the sweeping net to the relative safety of the bottom The sand appears to solidify as the octopus burrows beneath it to safety. It seems as though it secretes a coat of mucus to protect itself against the irritation of the gritty grains. As the team sleeps, the night shift is active, both close to the surface and deep beneath the hull. Dawn wakes the team at their anchorage a little way offshore. Today's exploration will take in the magical borderland between land and sea, the intertidal zone. As the light grows, they move inshore to where the falling tide is exposing one of the harshest environments on Earth. It's the frontier, the place where people meet the challenge of the sea head on and where the sea first bears the brunt of human activities. For the animals that live here, nature provides quite enough pressure. Any additional human pressure might well be the last straw. Knowing in general terms what animals might be living here, the team will make a detailed list of what they find to see whether this beach is healthy. Dr. Jane Fromont and the team will search the rocks and pools to find where the Dampier's intertidal zone, which has hardly ever been studied, is like those in other parts of the subtropical region. The fall of the tide imposes more than a period without water. Heavy rains can severely reduce the salinity and parching winds dry the air. The sun regularly raises the temperature to levels unbearable to animals not specially adapted to survive. A giant clam shuts tight, protecting its delicate soft tissues from drying out. Intertidal animals like crabs and fish must not only survive in warm water, but also hide from predators like this Brahmini kite. Rosette octopus is also a predator, hunting the tidal pools and sand flats. It has a soft, vulnerable body, but it is wonderfully camouflaged and has a very unusual way of defending itself. This fish is a master of camouflage. Its rock-like movement is ideal for ambush. It can survive out of water for long periods and with 13 potentially lethal spines along its back, there's no need for the stonefish to flee from predators. 
Without solid footwear, stepping on one will definitely ruin your day. The blue ring octopus produces enough venom to paralyze 10 adults, but that's not its main purpose. Hunting in this hostile environment, its soft body is vulnerable to the claws of the crabs and mantis shrimps, its principal prey. Both could cause a fatal injury to the blue ring. To minimize the risk, this beautiful mollusk uses its powerful venom to immobilize its prey swiftly. The intertidal sand flat where people like to take a relaxing stroll is a place where animals have to work hard for a living. Most of them are beneath the sand and overlooked by casual passers-by. The dog whelk, a busy scavenger, has a sense of smell like a bloodhound, sampling the water with a long siphon as it patrols the sands. Its teeth are mounted on a ribbon inside its retractable snout, emerging to strip the flesh from any carcass it can find. At high tide, whelks hide under the sand out of sight of hungry fish, waiting to rise the next time the tide falls. Starfish, too, are active scavengers. They also prey on slow-moving mollusks, which are not so slow-moving when they come under attack. In fact, none of these animals move slowly, by their own standards. The time-lapse camera reveals a scene of frenzied activity, but on a different time scale from our own. The mangrove forests round sheltered parts of the shore are very different from the open beach. The roots of the trees slow the flow of the tide, trapping sediment from the water. Mangroves are nature's land reclamation scheme. They're evergreen land plants, but they're highly tolerant of salt water. Aerial roots called pneumatophores prevent them from suffocating in the airless mud where they grow. Around the world, mangroves protect soft shorelines from erosion. Felling mangrove forests can lead to severe coastal flooding. Their roots and trunks offer a safe haven for small crabs, worms and mudskippers. Although there's been some general research into mangrove forests, there's still a lot to be learned about them at a detailed level. Dr Fred Wells from the Western Australian Museum is an authority on mud whelks which live on the forest floor. He's tagged more than 5,000 of them to find out about their movements, but his work has only just begun. His chosen place of work is hard to move about in and swarming with sand flies. All the time he is watched by the bulbous eyes of the mudskippers. Several species of snail have become adapted to living on the dry branches and trunks, an environment as challenging as the intertidal zone. Below them, a swimming mud crab shelters in a burrow. At high tide, it will scavenge among the trees. Red-legged fiddler crabs with their fiddle-like claws are active at low tide, defending their territories from their neighbors. A little blue juvenile can't stand up to a full-grown male. His enlarged claw is a formidable weapon, but is just as effective as a warning flag to herd trespassers off his land. Behind the mangroves, the ground is drier, flooded only by the highest spring tides. This area is home to another species, the elegant fiddler crab. The crabs feed in crowds to increase their chances of spotting danger. 
each crab is acutely aware of his neighbor's movements. The alarm spreads quickly like a chain reaction. Between spring tides when the mud is dry, the crabs survive in deep burrows, but they're not isolated underground. By rubbing their claws together, they produce vibrations that travel through the mud to other burrows, advertising the ownership of territory and the desire for a mate. Once a day, the tide floods into the mangroves, bringing with it another load of sediment, full of life-giving nutrients. The whole character of the forest changes, and with it the animal population. Predatory fish swim in, among them mangrove jacks. Now's the time for crabs and mudskippers to retreat to their burrows. For Clay Bryce and the team, it's time to dive. But diving in mangroves is different from diving in the open sea. I never get tired of diving in the mangroves, but it does take a little extra care. Loose straps and protruding gear are easily snagged, especially when the tide begins to surge. Animals drift in with the tide in search of food and protection. The mangroves act as nurseries for many marine creatures, including commercial fish. The tangled roots, filtered light and dim recesses are ideal hidey holes for juveniles and other small animals. but for all its surreal beauty, it is a habitat that does have a dark side. This turtle was trapped by the roots as the tide went out. Its life became measured by the time it takes for the tide to cover its head, plus the 30 minutes it can hold its breath. I keep thinking about the helpless struggle and wild panic that must have been a turtle's final companions. The team's next dive is to be in another very different place, quite unlike the cloistered calm and the cathedral gloom of the flooded mangrove forest. They're heading for a sponge garden in one of the deep channels between the islands. They have to hurry. The only safe time to dive there is at slack water, the time between high and low tides. Okay. They have to choose the site carefully using aerial photographs and navigation charts. 
safety must be their main consideration. It's going to be a rising slope, 15 metres to 11 metres on a gradual slope. So it's like garden bottom, so that should give uh, everybody what they need. This might be the most dangerous location of the whole expedition. The skipper has the final say. He knows these waters well. Just before slack water, the boat is on station over the sponge garden. like a garden full of plants, but a sponge garden contains only animals. There's not a plant to be seen. A lack of light and the scarring sand from the current make it impossible for plants to grow. There's a wide assortment of sponges with a few deep water corals among them. A sponge the size of a human head can filter 24,000 litres of seawater in a single day. That's half the volume of a backyard swimming pool. Because they're filter feeders, the animals need to live where the currents bring them food, detritus falling from higher levels or washed from the seabed upstream. They come in a bewildering range of colours, shapes and sizes. A small brittle star is perfectly camouflaged against a bright orange sponge. A sea cucumber feeds on scraps trapped by the mucus round the entrance to a barrel sponge. A carnivorous sea slug which eats only sponges collects the toxins from the sponge into its own body. It stores the poison in special glands from which it can secrete it to defend itself against predators. Many of the animals that live in the sponge garden have never been named, especially the amazing variety of sea slugs. Very little is known about their biology. There are just too many animals and too few biologists to study them. For now, they must remain part of the mystery of the deep. everywhere in the sponge garden, in holes in the sand and deep underground, living on and in the sponges themselves and on animals that live on the sponges. It's a highly complex, multi-level forest of animals. The one thing they all have in common is their dependence on the tidal current. Sponge gardens need a strong current to keep them going. The current brings food to all members of the community. The animals grow so that they face full into the current to increase their chances of getting their share of the food. The current makes it a difficult place to dive. This is why slack water is the only safe time for the divers to be here. As the tide begins to flow, they begin to find it harder to concentrate on their work. Small fishes take shelter on the lee side of sponges. One damselfish has its own solution to the problem, while other fishes waste energy fighting against the increasing water movement. As the current gathers speed, feather stars fling wide their long arms like a fisherman's net to maximize their catch.
this is a good time for the inhabitants of the sponge garden but for the divers it means the end of their visit the anchor line is their link with the boat and the surface without it there's a good chance that they'd be swept away by the current The sponge garden is pristine, untouched by human activity. Elsewhere along the industrialized shore, it's a different matter. Here, there is people pressure, ranging from recreational fishermen to industry. Vast industrial complexes line the shore, together with wharves and jetties, and the other infrastructure that supports them. Building such objects in such a beautiful place might seem like an assault on nature, but the construction work also provides nature herself with new opportunities. The piles that support this wharf offer a perfect surface for young animals to settle and grow. To them, it's like a huge open underwater cave. Each animal and plant can settle where the depth, light intensity and wave action are just right for it. Every nook and cranny is occupied by some creature for which it is an ideal home. are connected to the gas fields offshore by a pipeline part buried by sand and covered with a layer of rocks to protect it against storms and ships anchors. From being a blot on the seabed it's become in effect an artificial reef that nature has claimed as her own. Above, predatory fish gather to prey on the smaller fry below. Dr. Barry Hutchins, another member of the team, prepares to record the numbers and variety of the small fish attracted by the man-made reef. He finds that the pipeline reef has a rich fish fauna, comparable to or even better than that of many natural reefs. In any habitat, man-made or natural, the same life stories are played out season by season. From birth to death, an animal's existence is precarious at best. The marine world can be an unforgiving place. A lionfish hovers beside a rock ledge, home to a pair of harassed sailfin catfish. By a combination of patience and lightning attacks, it has managed to eat all but one of their babies. The bereaved parents must now guard the entrance to their den continuously to defend the future of the family.
two weeks among the islands of the archipelago has generated enough work to keep the researchers busy back in their offices for about two years the specimens will have to be identified and the data analyzed next the collected information will need to be compared with other regions only then will they gain a real insight into the biodiversity of the Dampier archipelago. Continuous monitoring and vigilance by industry, government and the community should ensure its survival into the future. The work of the expedition so far suggests that Dampier is one of those rare and perhaps unique places where heavy industry and the environment appear to coexist in relative harmony. But Clay is aware that there's more to the story. Balancing industrial needs against the needs of the environment can never be risk-free. Accidents will always happen. But it's how these accidents are minimised and contained that's important. After all, there is a lot at stake. <laughs> 